Well, the reason that we're singing this is as I was getting ready for bed and ready to put my head on the pillow a few days ago, this song began to go over and over in my head. I already had a direction I was going. I thought I was going with a sermon, but I, I couldn't get away from that, so I got up and started writing. And so, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to talk about destiny, about that time in which we live right now that we just don't float through life and breathe in and breathe out. You have a plan for each one of us. And as we share the word together today, we open our eyes, ears, our understanding that we would know even better why we're here during this time on the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. And welcome T.T. back today. Yay! <laughs> We love answered prayers, do we not? When we pray, we believe God hears and he responds in the way he chooses to, but we believe in healing, uh, and so we continue to pray for people that are sick because we believe in the healer. For such a time as this, so here we are seated this morning in the Christian church, first Christian church. Some have been here um, how many years? Back in the back, how many years, uh, Estel, have you been here? Have you been here? Many of us have been here. Now you're back. Oh, how long have you been here? 80 years. 80 years. Wow. So no matter when we're born, we have a purpose throughout our lives, which is still going on today. There's still purpose for a man that has been here for 80 years. And um, so we're here, we've chosen to be here today in the house of God because this is a value that has been instilled in us, many of us, all of our lives, to attend church, to keep the Sabbath. This is the Sabbath and we give God the first day of the week. But there's a span of time in which we live and we're part of the world right now and the world seems pretty chaotic, but God has known all about this. How many believe that? He, he has the whole world in his hands. And though some of us think it couldn't get any worse, think of the people in this building that were also on the earth during World War II yeah. and what was going on during that time. And we're still standing. Uh, God has been with us all the time. Time is an interesting word because there's the Bible talks about chronological time, just day after day, sometimes repeating the same thing. Some of us do. We have habits every day. But there's kairos time, suddenly moments. And I hope you've experienced that, some of you, that there are times that, whoa, all of a sudden you have a great awakening in your own life and you wish you could just sit there the rest of your life in the presence of God. I love those times. Tom and I have been watching the Olympics, I mean obsessed with watching them every single night till then we'll put it on record if it's finally too late and we have to go to bed. But uh, something interesting, and I copied it on Facebook, was written by... Um, uh, she jumped hurdles and ran the 400 and got gold medals, and her name is Sydney McLaughlin Lavroni, I believe is how you pronounce her last name. But it, here's what she wrote. This is what she said after she received her gold medal. What I have in Christ is far greater than what I have or don't have in life. He prepared me for a moment such as this, that's why we were singing the song, because it applies to all of us. We are here for such a time as this. And that's what she said, that I may use the gifts he has given me to point all the attention back to him. Don't you love that? I believe our time spent here on earth, once we understand who Jesus Christ is and the price that he has paid 
for each one of us to be able to live an abundant life in him. The Bible says in 1 John, one of the purposes he came, he lived and died in a short span in Jesus' life from the beginning to the end, and now he's seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and we believe that. And he even prays for us. It says in, in uh, John 17, I believe, he prayed for his disciples, and then it says, and this is how he would pray for us right now. That's very reassuring, isn't it? Um, that um, we have the Savior who lived and died for us. But in First John it says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest, to destroy all the works of the evil one. And you think sometimes, really, <laughs> seems like there's still a lot of evil on the earth, but he's given us authority in the time in which we live and even in our particular region where we are. We should always pray for our church to be safe, for God to fill the pews. You see, our life, I believe, especially once we come to Christ and learn how to read the Bible. How many, was the Bible pretty dead to you until you came to Christ and all of a sudden, that's my testimony, I was raised in church and you'd think I'd have known the Bible better than I did, but I did not. I just sort of knew it and it was pretty dead until I yielded my life to him and said I'll follow you it's your will now not my will that's what our life is like and so the bible became alive would just scriptures would leap off the page sometime because it was so new but the bible says it's alive and full of power sharper than any two-edged sword of course then it would influence our lives so, according to the Word of God, we are in this world, the Bible says, but we're not to engage so much in, world, in the worldliness of the world. Does that make sense? We still need to be here. We don't cloister ourselves in our little room and just stay there because it's so bad outside. If he's destroyed the works of the evil one, wherever he's caused us to work, he'll go before us. He will help us. How many believe that your life here is to help other people? Amen. I mean, it's not for our own self-centeredness. It never has been. Uh, that's why we want to train our children at a long, young age not to get everything they want. And how about sharing? I tell you, I was raised with there's seven siblings in my family. I mean, you had to split the candy bar, you know. <laughs> And, and then you measured to make sure they weren't cheating you somehow. How many did that? <laughs> yeah. And now it, it's, there's so much of an abundance, but it might not always be that way. So it's good to train our children that in this world, we're not of the world. We are part of the kingdom of God. We are called to bring light into darkness. If we go back and study the Beatitudes which were the very first teachings of Jesus Christ, that we, we are to be kind, merciful. We need to be reminded in church because the nation seems to be so split, and I really don't want to spend much time on that, but we can be kind, yes. can't we? Yes. We don't have to roll up our sleeves and go to war. We go roll up our sleeves to do battle against the darkness. Um, and so we are to be kind, uh, we're to be merciful. If we're merciful, Jesus said we receive mercy. If we are peacemakers, isn't it a day to be a peacemaker? Then he calls us the children of God if we are peacemakers during this time in which, which we live. You know, with Esther, we're not in her day now. But she was called to save her nation to be part of a harem and hope to be selected to be the queen. The queen had not obeyed like she should have and so they're looking for another one. But she's representing Jewish people but she has not told the king who she really is. But her uncle Mordecai tells her it's time. It's such a time as this. It is time for you now to reveal who you are. And she's very frightened to do this because she's afraid now she might be killed uh, for misrepresenting herself. And so he tells her, in essence, if you don't do it, 
then God will raise up somebody else. But it would seem like this is your time. This is such a time as this for you, Esther. And she obeys, and, it's, and it ends well in the story, if you want to look up the story. But uh, she even had an attitude, I reread that this morning, that she said, if I perish, I perish. You know, God calls us not because we're special and we're so talented, but after we obey him, then we become special. We become gifted because he has gifts to give to each one of us. And it's up to us. He chose us, as that song says. We really didn't choose him. How many remember whether you were really young? Tom was very young when he came to the Lord. But he had a conviction that he needed Christ in his life. I was a little bit later in my life. But I can still remember how he visited, he seemed to just visit me. See, God is a spirit. Holy Spirit is here on the earth and he visited me and I kept knowing he wants more out of me. How many have ever felt like that? He wants more. That's the spirit of God. And everybody in the Old Testament, the heroes that we know in the Old Testament, have one thing in common. Their obedience to God. Many of them said, here am I. Even little Samuel thought that it, uh, it was Eli, the prophet that he lived with, was talking to him because he kept hearing this voice. And he finally instructed him, no, that's the Lord talking to you. Well, he ended up being a great prophet to the nations. So they said yes, Abraham was called to leave his home, his surroundings, and didn't go back. And he, his obedience was he just did what God said. And that's what I want to talk about today. This is your time right now, every one of us, in this day in which we live. We're not, again, we're not to be part of the world. Let me read this in Romans 12. <clears throat> Pretty strong words from Paul. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. You see, when we give ourselves to the Lord, wholly, totally, saying whatever you call me to do, that is what I'll do. Now again, our heroes of faith often didn't feel qualified. Remember the burning bush and Moses? It's like, God, I don't even know how to talk well. And you're asking me to go speak to these people and deliver them? And, and, and they negotiated, talked, tried to talk God out of it. We don't talk him out of it. Do you understand? If he calls you, he equips you. It's not because you know so much what you're doing. He may use uh, your education, what you already know how to do, but I guarantee you he will call you to step out of your comfort zone. Amen? He will call you to step out of your comfort zone, and you will never be sorry if you do that. I could give you an example after example. I, I waited about 10 years when I felt like God was calling me because I was afraid of what he was calling me to do. As it turns out, I had every reason to be afraid of what he was calling me to do because I have some very unusual things that were designed just for me. You see, it, you're, we're a church and we pray for our church to follow the plan of God for this church. And I'm excited for the pastor to get back because he's had time to really be alone and spend time with God and get some really godly wisdom of where we are headed in the future. And I'm excited about it. I won't be up here but two more weeks and then we'll be sitting up there. And so I can listen to him and, and catch the vision. In church, we must catch the vision that the pastor has and he, of course, talks to elders and different people. He doesn't make up his mind all himself. But many times the vision will come to the pastor. 
and then it's up to him to tell us the vision and us to catch it and run with it. We have limited time here on this earth. And so he said, for I say through the grace given to me to everyone among you not to think more highly of themselves than they ought to think, but think soberly as God has dealt each one a measure of faith. We've been talking about increasing our faith. And I hope this summer that has happened to me, to all of us, that we feel like we're walking a little bit stronger in faith than when we started out. But each is given a measure of faith. And as you exercise your faith, then your faith will grow more. And I'll tell you one of the calls. I feel like I'm supposed to share this today. Uh, just be thankful you're not me. And uh, God hadn't called you to do some of the things he's called me to do. Why he has done that? I could make excuses like Jeremiah would say, I'm too young. And he said, but I called you even from your mother's, even before you were in your mother's womb, I called you. That still didn't convince him. He said, don't you, have you not seen how young I am? But the Bible says that he induced him, which means he overly persuaded him to do God's will, not his will. Well, later they don't like the message, the people. The worldly people do not like the message he gives to them. And so they not only beat him up, he's thrown in prison. And that's when he has a, a conversation. You made me do this. You overly persuaded me to do this. But you didn't tell me how bad it was going to be. And then later he says, I want to quit, but this, there's a fire inside of me that I have to keep telling people. So that's the kind of call I'm talking about. Whatever it is, there ought to be a fire from God to do what he calls you to do. So I'm minding my own business. It's around 1980. I'm following the Lord now. I'm saying not my will but yours be done. And I have, I, I don't know what I'm saying. We don't know what we're saying because none of these people knew what God was calling them to do. Noah, how would you like to have been Noah in his day? But I get a phone call and I take the call and it's a pastor on the phone. He says, I hear you're a, a really great soul winner. See, when I came to the Lord, I couldn't be quiet. I met Jesus. I met Jesus. I've been in church all my life, but I met Jesus. So I couldn't be quiet. You know, I probably said this. One of my friends, we were sponsors at a girls' high school social club. And as we're driving over to the meeting that night, she says to me, do you feel like you're going to have to talk about Jesus? I mean, see, you're going to have opposition if you're on fire. You will have opposition, I guarantee you. And I kind of timidly, well, I don't know, you know, you know, you feel really put down. But I've been talking about him, and I even had a pastor tell me that I'd get over it. I'd get over it. He doesn't know. My name is Kylie. We're Irish. You don't tell us what we can't do. That makes us just tell, say Jesus that much more. So I get the phone call. And I hear you're a great soul winner. Well, we take teams to Mardi Gras. And I'm like blinking. And wondered if you'd go with us. And I'm being really polite. You've probably done this on the phone. But you're thinking, this is the craziest thing. Are you crazy? I've never been to Mardi Gras when I was lost. I'm not going in that mess. And as it turns out, it's worse than I thought it was. <laughs> and so I go upstairs, just pretend that I never got that. Went upstairs. As God is my witness, I had a new, remember tapes? <laughs> tapes with music on them. It was by Randy Cutlip who had been part of Three Dog Night. I'd never, I don't know whether I'd ever listened to them or not, but he had gotten saved. He had come to Chillicothe at the Assembly of God Church, and I liked him so much, I ordered the tape. Well, the mail came one day. It was from his headquarters. There was a slit in it, and the tape was gone. That's the devil that does stuff like that. Made me mad, I thought I'll order it again. So I ordered it a second time. It had just come. To me, and I thought, well, why get ready this morning and do all my stuff in front of the mirror? 
I'll put in that tape. Three songs in, on the sidewalks of New Orleans, thought, <laughs> during Mardi Gras, I died to make men holy. Won't you try to set men free? I thought, no. <laughs> so I called my husband then and said, guess what? I mean, he's kind of used to this, what's up next? And so I ended up years taking teams. See, when God calls me to do something, it seems like I'm always called to train other people to go with me on mission trips and this sort of stuff. Folks, it was awful, awful. The lostness of people on those streets and their half-dressed clothes, their language. If you said, hi, Jesus loves you, and the verbiage that comes back at you is shocking. Our team would stop and just keep praying because it's, it's like you stepped into hell. But I'll tell you something, you saw souls saved. Believe it or not, people got out of their bondage when we shared Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. Amen. Always in our lives. It's high time, Romans says. It's high time that we see the lost, the people that are waiting for somebody to tell them about Jesus. One girl, beautiful little girl, I can still see her face. She had some kind of stuff on her face, some painting on her face. And I said, hi honey, Jesus loves you. She burst into tears and said he couldn't love me. I've had an abortion. So I put my arms around her and prayed for her to receive Christ and receive forgiveness for that. She was convicted that she would never see God. And I said, he loves you. He has mercy upon you. I pray for you to be healed of this torment you have. And now turn around and walk out of this place right now. And she did. Amen. I believe one day I might, might see her in heaven. And she'll say, thank you that you tried to set men free. Thank you, Father, for such a time as this. You've called this church to great works. I believe that with all my heart. That we will go to the highways and the byways and compel them to come. We will reach out to every group that feels like they're not good enough to come to church or to have Jesus love them. May we be so filled with your spirit that it would be contagious and they would want what we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.